Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter, and you can follow me at the Kung Fu Genius. I got great news for KFG fans. For a limited time, you can get $5 off any order of $20 or more by using the code KFG5OFF at CityWT.com. You can use this code for books, training equipment, t-shirts, and apparel. That code is KFG5OFF, and you can use that $5 off for any order of $20 or more at CityWT.com. And that also includes using it towards my new book, The 15 Chi Cell Fundamentals, which just arrived and is still available while supplies last. The response to the pre-order was amazing, and we only have a few left, so get yours now. And you can always support this channel and podcast in simple ways, like subscribe to the channel, like the video, turn on notifications, and rate it wherever you get this podcast. And with that, let's get started. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue to discuss the secretly recorded Bruce Lee conversation with his student, Daniel Lee. Lots of gems, lots of Fook Young, lots of Bruce T. Let's get to it. He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Word is, I'm a Kung Fu genius. Practice all day like a genius. <laughs> All right, Dre, how you doing, man? Good, Sifu. I'm good. <laughs> I like this shirt, by the way. Thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah, this yeah. is the second one of its kind that I've had. The, you know, the original one where they took that photo. I think the original photo, I believe, Bruce Lee's at a party. Uh -huh. And uh, Unicorn, his buddy Unicorn Chan is there. I'm not even sure. It might even be a birthday cake that he's originally over. I have to go back and look. <laughs> right. uh, and then they photoshopped it to make it look like he's Switched on up, some yeah. DJ turntables, right? Sick. But what a lot of people don't realize is that crazy gold medallion he's wearing, that's not photoshopped. He actually that's did wear his. that in the original photo, right? <laughs> Ice down medallion. Yeah, okay. it's pretty, pretty awesome. Wow. So uh, anyway, here we are. This is the third part to that Bruce Lee conversation, yes. which the Bruce Lee conversation Part one was actually our very first episode of the Kung Fu Genius. And so this, uh, you know, to give some people background, and of course, if you don't know about this, I would recommend going back to part one and part two, mm -hmm. uh, further back into our episode list, because this was a secretly recorded phone conversation between Bruce Lee and his student, Daniel Lee. Daniel All right? Lee. Now, I've, I've since learned a couple things since the um, we first started doing it. Some of them I talked about in the second episode, but again... Remember in my debunking episode, I said one of the reasons why I do this is because if there are people out there who know more and can provide context yeah. and give me more information, that's exactly what Comment, I want, right? Yeah. But when you have a YouTube channel and even if you just, when you say anything and people will sometimes just want to have issue with it because you're in a video saying something and they are not as if somehow they cannot create their own video and do their own exactly. thing, right? You guys see sometimes in the comments, I'm like, hey, sounds like you know a lot. You should do your own video. You should have your own channel because it's not like I had to get approved by some board or something like that. Anyone can have a YouTube channel, right? I thought you had to get approved by no, some board. Not at all. Not at all. Believe it or not, it's extremely easy to put videos <laughs> on YouTube, all right? This whole time. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. Know. That's just what we told you. So, <laughs> so I wouldn't go around <laughs> starting right. podcasts. That's right. All so over I can keep place. you under control here. Yeah. I can keep an eye on you the whole right. time, right? Don't let this guy make his own videos, <laughs> no. right? So so anyway, you know, the, the whole mission is, one, to talk about these things that I like to have. You know, one of the differences between our Kung Fu Genius podcast and, let's say, Dudes of Kung Fu, which I did before, is Dudes of Kung Fu was very, um, very heavily on... Wing Chun and Jeet Kune Do, you know, Big Sean being the JKD guy, although he also practiced Wing Chun, uh, and me being the Wing Chun guy. So it most of the topics were about training Wing Chun and, you know, Jeet Kune Do and this kind of stuff. Occasionally, we went into Bruce Lee stuff. Right. Occasionally, we would talk about 80s ninja movies, you know, the kind of things that came up. But really, the Kung Fu Genius podcast is about me having the kind of conversations that if you were just hanging out with me and we were having a coffee, these are the kind of things I talk about. Yeah. And sometimes I'm really big into like historical stuff. Sometimes I'm big into like the frivolous nature of uh, ninja films from the 80s and how they impacted me. And other times I want to have some serious discussions of training methods. And sometimes it's just straight nonsense. Exactly. And, and I got to touch on, this is something that we would do after class. Yes. A lot. Right, we right. We would all hang out. And you would just go into some stories or something, and we would just hang out for and like an hour here after class. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you the story about yeah. this guy and that guy or whatever. Right. So yeah, basically, 
the Kung Fu Genius, all right, which of course, again, I, the title is very ironic, right? I'm not even in the top <laughs> Just to 15. Just put that out and make yeah, sure, yeah. I'm not even in the top 15 of knowledge, like of the people in my close circle, yeah. right? So again, I have to remind people, the title Kung Fu Genius is definitely used with sarcasm and irony. And sometimes you have to tell people this, right? Because mm -hmm. there's sometimes there are comments like, do you, you know, do you really, if somebody like, do you really call yourself the Kung Fu genius, right? And it's on your card. Right. But the gag was, you know, like the guy's handle was like, you know, Burger Man 22. I'm like, do people really call <laughs> you Burger you. Man 22? Burger right? Man. <laughs> like, you know, take it easy, buddy. All right. Uh, you know, just the, fear, just the mere fact that you have a video or you do anything out there automatically, just people will just look at you like mm, for whatever reason, even before listening to hmm. you. Right. So anyway, uh, a couple things I learned from, you, you know, the, the original phone conversation with Daniel Lee, as I've mentioned before, was secretly recorded. That is, Bruce Lee did not know he was being recorded, which, as I mentioned before, technically makes this recording illegal. Illegal. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but like his some places we know. <laughs> exactly. Right. But his student, Daniel Lee, recorded him because I think uh, this was at the time where Bruce had just done. He had done Big Boss. So he was already uh, already a, a bona fide star in Asia. And he had just finished. Fists of Fury, but it had not yet come out. And you hear later in this conversation, he actually uh, describes uh, Fists of Fury to Daniel Lee, who would not have seen it because it didn't come out yet. So it, this conversation is wow. interesting because it's one of the only times where you can actually hear Bruce Lee uh, describe what one of his movies are like. We've all seen his films. Looking forward to getting to this right. section. But of you never the... actually heard Bruce Lee like say like, hey, what is Fists of Fury about? And this conversation, he actually yeah. explains it like to someone who had not seen it yet, which is really fascinating, right? Yeah, from his point of view. Too. Yeah. Like the painter goes over his painting. Exactly, yeah. right? And you rarely get that perspective, mm. right? So that's why I like this conversation. Obviously, I like this conversation for another, uh, um, well, a couple more reasons. Well, one, Because you like Bruce Lee's voice. Uh, it's just great to hear Bruce <laughs> Lee, right? Uh, one, he talks about uh, the um, that tai chi fight right which i've since found out more information about that and i'll get into that in a second he oh, also yeah. mentions lao tai chun this you know famous did it happen did it not happen fight i have since found out new information about Ooh. that right and the rest of the conversation he talks about he talks a little bit about other martial arts he talks about uh, Thai boxers. He talks about uh, a karate. He talks about some of his students. So there's there's a lot of stuff in this conversation to unpack, and uh, so I just find it fascinating because again, this is the only conversation, uh, the only recording of Bruce Lee where you can hear him in a pretty unfiltered way. So he's not. This is not um, an interview that's for TV. This, this isn't the Pierre Burton. You know, lost interview. This isn't uh, him reciting anything for a magazine. This is Bruce Lee, pardon my French, shooting the shit with one of his students, yeah. right? So it's very much, you, you really get the feeling like if you were just sitting and having a coffee with Bruce Lee yeah. or a tea. This, Bruce T. Yeah, Bruce T, right? Okay, <laughs> registered trademark, Shannon Lee. All right, we got to give her 25 cents just for saying that. Oh, no. Uh, that, My you know, man. this is, yeah, I know. I'm probably going to have to edit it out, right? Because every time you mention Bruce T, you got to pay the Lee estate 25 cents, okay? So anyway, uh, in fact, I think I have to pay them 80 cents just for wearing the shirt. So so anyway, um, <laughs> you know, it was funny. There was a comment, because, uh, you know, like I've said, most of the comments on our podcast are very positive, right, yeah. on, on YouTube, right? And I didn't think necessarily that they would be positive because, you know, just anytime you talk about traditional martial arts or Bruce Lee or Wing Chun. There's just like people out there that their sole purpose is just to crap on that stuff, right? Yeah, everyone it's like, has their two cents. Well, yeah. but it's like, there's a certain segment of the YouTube watching public, which is like, they're not into anything. They're just, they just hate stuff. Into right? trolling. Yeah, and there's just like a, a group of people that don't like Bruce Lee, don't like Wing Chun, don't like traditional martial arts, and they just wait for these videos to come out just so that they can comment, right? <laughs> right. It's like, but they actually have no interests on their own, right? And, uh, you, you know, so oh, like, yes. yeah, there was one person that was like on uh, one of the previous videos was going back and forth on Bruce Lee death conspiracies because in the Matt Pauly episode, um, you know, Matt Pauly has his heat stroke hypothesis. Right. And yes, then I remember yeah. in that uh, what I did was from some of those early episodes, I just took some clips from a few of those episodes and I released them Can't as shorter clips. videos. Right. So that people, you know, who maybe have not heard the full podcast 
they might come to our podcast if they hear like little two minute, three minute clips. I haven't done that for any of the recent episodes, but I'll start doing that again, especially when we start running out of ideas, right? Then I'll start chopping up all that old stuff. Hey guys, new stuff, it's old stuff, but it's chopped down, right? So, uh, because that actually brings in a totally different audience. We got the people who listen to our podcast every week, and then you just got people who are searching Bruce Lee death or Bruce Lee Wing Chun, and then they're gonna find those little clip videos, right? Got it. So it's almost like, a, I have almost like a separate audience that comments on those clip videos compared to the audience that comments on the regular full podcast, right? And there's one guy who just keeps going on and on about uh, Fook Young. Fook Young was a, a friend of Bruce Lee's father, Lei Hoi Chun. He lived in Seattle. And, you know, Bruce Lee's father, through being an opera actor, had a number of connections even in the States because the, in fact, Bruce Lee was born in the U.S. because his father was traveling through the U.S. Uh, at the time that Bruce yeah. Lee was born, right? Which is why Bruce Lee was right an American place, citizen, right, right? But as a result, his father had a lot of connections in the States. So when he sent Bruce over to go to Seattle, you know, they knew Ruby Chow, who owned the restaurant where Bruce Lee stayed. They knew a number of people. And uh, one of these that Bruce Lee's father knew was a guy named Fu Yang. Well, Fu Yang was kind of like an avuncular character in Bruce Lee's life. Avuncular means like an uncle, okay? Right. Oh, yeah. Because I'm looking at your yeah. face, right? <laughs> you saw my brain <laughs> shut down for a second, like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, in that kind of very typical Chinese way where, where friends of your parents, okay. you usually, in Chinese, you refer to them as uncle, all right? Got it. Other cultures do similar things as well. Uh, I'm half Cuban. I can't tell you how many cousins and uncles I have that are actually probably not even blood related to me. Yeah. yeah. All, I have a lot of avuncular <laughs> characters, right? In my life, right? And so with thick Cuban accents, they all sound like Scarface, right? And so anyway, Fook Young was kind of one of these, you know, avuncular characters in, in Bruce Lee's life. Fook Young taught Bruce Lee some martial arts, okay? Oh, wow. And so, um, however, when you look at the notes and you look at the books that were written by Bruce Lee's students, the people who were with him day in and day out, whether we're talking about uh, uh, recollections from James DeMille or you talk about uh, Jesse Glover's in-depth book, uh, which obviously he, he self-published it and he's passed away. I don't know if you can even get it anymore. It's called for Bruce Lee Between Wing Chun and Jeet Kune Do. And he talks in very, very specific detail about what Bruce was doing and all this. When you read all of these things, you get the impression that Fu Young was someone who knew his father and Fu Young showed Bruce Lee some kind of operatic style Kung Fu movements. Okay. And th the reason why you know we, we know this is because there are few people, even in Doug Palmer's uh, latest book, he mentions Fu Young, but very, very briefly, right? He's never mentioned more as just being kind of a tertiary character in Bruce hmm. Lee's life, right? And uh, Bruce, when he came to the States, he wanted to have a couple kung fu moves that were impressive. Because one of the things about Wing Chun is that from a, uh, from a spectator standpoint, yeah. it's not the most, you know, if you want to put an audience to sleep, you just stand and do the Siunim Tao form in front of them, right? right? And the form may have all these great benefits and might help you in your path to learn Wing Chun, might be, even be the most important form. Oh, but if you goodness. do this in front of an audience, all right, this is going to happen, right? Uh -huh. So, of course, Bruce, having an acting background, wanted to have a couple kung fu moves that he can use in, flare, in, in, yeah. in a way to kind of you know show off, like, hey, look at this. And even before he left Hong Kong, and this I read in uh, some interview with uh, the late Hawkins Chung, who was a, a friend of Bruce Lee's. They went to St. Francis Xavier together. Uh, he mm -hmm. said that Bruce mentioned to Hawkins, like, oh, when I go to the States, I'm going to teach Wing Chun. And Hawkins kind of laughed a little bit like, well, Bruce, you don't really even know that much Wing Chun. What, what are you going to teach? You, gonna teach you, you know what I mean? Like the assumption being like, well, once you showed them Pak Sao, Lap Sao, chain punches and <laughs> some basic Chi Sao, yeah. uh, how are you going to keep them coming for more, right? And so Bruce got the idea um, to learn from, uh, again, another avuncular character, a, a friend of the family uh, named... Siu Hon Sang. Siu Hon yeah. Sang. And Uncle Siu, right? And oh, Uncle cool. Siu was, uh, was an actor as well, um, in the same circle of friends as his father. And he was a martial artist who had trained in the Jing Wu or Jing Mo Academy in Hong Kong. Cool. And I believe that he had even trained together with Sekin uh, Han from Enter yeah, the Dragon, right? Okay. Uh, so um, Uncle Siu knew those Jing Wu styles, those, uh, you know, the very traditional. Um, martial arts forms, but also the the standard um, 
standardized traditional forms, for lack of a better term, the 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 Jing Wu Ten, like things like Tom Toy, the Springing Leg, and uh, Gong Lit Kun, and all of these kind of forms, right? Nice. And it, it's not to put any of that stuff down, but normally the 10 Jing Wu forms, they're considered kind of 10 generic Kung Fu forms you learn first, and then you go and specialize in a style. In the Jing Wu Academy, you normally learned these 10 or so forms, and then you either perhaps went and learned Eagle Claw or you went and learned uh, Northern Mantis, but like all of those styles kind of learned hmm. these first 10 forms. So Bruce went to Uncle Siu, and the, the joke was that he, Bruce, you know, who was the cha-cha champion, Bruce was going to teach Uncle Siu some of his cha-cha steps, and okay. Uncle Siu was then in turn going to teach him some of these kung fu forms, so that Bruce had in his pocket some flashier looking stuff to which, uh, cool. uh, for which he could impress the uh, the non-discerning Western audience. Yeah, right? Give him like ten cha-cha moves. Exactly. But the... the gag was Bruce Lee ended up picking up these moves. Uh, I think he learned a couple forms, including including kung lit kun and a form I believe is called jeet kun. All right, oh. which is funny because it's almost like a little bit of foreshadowing. Although I believe the Jeet character is a different character than Intercept, but uh, someone someone who knows better that can can correct me on that. But anyway, you start to to hear this a little bit, right? Now he learned, I think he learned two or three forms, okay, from Uncle Siu. Mm. He picked them up so quickly. He ended up not teaching Uncle Siu any of his cha-cha steps, and then like <laughs> I think a month later, he was already on the boat to go to the states, right? <laughs> So that was Damn. that was kind of it, but but when you see Bruce Lee perform on the screen in the screen test, you know the the what later became essentially his screen test for Green Hornet, you know the black and white. And he's like, you know, I'm I'm Bruce Lee. I'm 24 years old, yeah. right? And he goes, this is a crane form, right? And then he busts out those crane shapes, right? So that is most likely what he learned from Uncle Siu in Hong Kong shortly before he came to the States, right? Okay. Because people go, well, how did Bruce Lee, a Wing Chun guy, a Wing Chun guy suddenly know how to like, you know, whip out uh, some kind of crane moves like that, right? And that's probably what he learned from Uncle Siu. Got it. If you watch that, un, uh, if you watch the complete screen test, you also see in there, Bruce Lee also explains how different characters in the Chinese opera walk differently. You know, like the scholar walks a certain way I've and, never seen and this. the warrior walks a certain way. And it's possible that those are things that he learned just growing up because his father was an opera actor. It's also right. possible those might have been things that Fook Young in Seattle showed him, right? But of course, yeah, makes sense. as is often the case with Bruce Lee, if someone served coffee to Bruce Lee once in 1966, after Bruce Lee died, that person who served <laughs> that coffee once, okay... Well, actually, Bruce Lee used to come every week and we would sit down and chat oh, and we yeah. would talk about the nature of the Tao. And, you know, the whole idea of the yellow tracksuit. Actually, I was the one who gave him that over coffee once. Right. So you find that people's memories about their influence on Bruce Lee mm. um, or people's memories on how they defeated Bruce Lee in a fight in 1964. Those become clearer oh. with age. All right. Which it's normally the other way around. Right. right? right. Um, when also when you look at Bruce Lee's letters and Bruce was someone who he wrote a lot of letters you can see uh, Letters of the Dragon which was um, put together by John Little who's been on this podcast mm -hmm. when you read all of the letters you're going to find that Fook Yang is not a prominent character in Bruce Lee's very prolific letter writing in, in, in recent years f people have there's like Fook Yang followers all right, cultists who are like Fook it's Young, a thing. no, they're like Fook Young was the most important teacher in Bruce Lee's life, and and here's the thing, and Bruce Lee experts, you know, like Matt Pauly and John Little, they don't want you to know that, okay, <laughs> or they don't know that. So and and it's kind of funny, it's because like, oh, you know, all of the Bruce Lee experts worldwide, okay, whether it's Richard Torres, Matt Pauly, John Little, or I don't even consider myself a Bruce Lee expert, but let's pretend I'm at that table too. Yeah. Every year we get together and we go, okay, what are our um, what are our objectives wow. for this year? Okay, <laughs> well, number one, we cannot let people know that Bruce Lee learned from Fook Yeah, It's completely ridiculous because imagine if Bruce Lee in the States had a Chinese instructor that completely revolutionized the way he looked at things, taught him a number of things that he didn't even know in Hong Kong when he beat the boxer Gary Elms. Yeah. Um, and, you know, was this a, a tremendous influence? One, why wouldn't Bruce Lee admit it? And two, why wouldn't we, as we want to know everything we can about Bruce Lee, why wouldn't we 
want to tell the whole world about this. Well, as it turns out, there's very little evidence to suggest that that was even the case. Mm. That Bruce Lee's relationship with Fuk Young is highly, highly exaggerated by a certain pocket of people out there. All right. So anyway, one of these Fuk Young guys was just trolling on my comments like, yeah, people don't even know who the real teacher of Bruce Lee was. And the guy totally step, stepped on his on his own wee wee <laughs> with this here. Right. Because he goes, yeah, Bruce Lee learned from Fuk Young for eight years. And I go. So he goes, Bruce Lee's real teacher taught him for eight years. And I go, hmm, well, given what we know about when Bruce Lee probably started learning Wing Chun, Bruce Lee probably learned no more than three years. OK, let's give Bruce Lee three years. OK, yeah. well, he didn't do Wing Chun for eight years in Hong Kong. Even if you gave Bruce Lee that he started at 13, which I don't believe you, I believe he started at 15. But Bruce Lee left when he was 18. So that meant Bruce Lee at most did martial arts for five years in Hong Kong. Gotcha. But this guy's like, this teacher taught Bruce Lee for eight years. And I go, mm. he wasn't even doing martial arts for eight years in Hong Kong. So this teacher had to be teaching him. I had to have taught him in the States. The okay. problem is Bruce Lee did not live in any one place in the States for more than eight years. <laughs> Yo. Not even close most of the time. So, and then I, I'm reading this guy's comment and I can, I can smell, <laughs> I can smell the BS of a Fook Young cultist on here, right? It's, and it's yeah, and the, the, the whiff of, you know, he's his real teacher, right? Bruce Lee, one, arguably one of the biggest innovators of Chinese martial arts, someone who saw that there, there were problems in the traditional way of doing things and you have to have a more open mind. You have to integrate, dare I say, even some Western ideas about conditioning and boxing and moving and things like this. Yeah. Someone who is really very iconoclastic to the traditional martial arts world. His biggest influence was a traditional Chinese opera guy. <laughs> okay? okay? I mean, like... Again, it's like when people have these stories, sometimes you read it online and you're like, oh, maybe. But one of the first tests for anything, it's not an absolute test, is say the story out loud. Yeah. Along with, said that. along with all of its implications. Okay. Okay. Just say the story according to their facts, give them their facts, and give them their implications, what this means. And say it out loud and just listen to what that sounds like. Now, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. There's lots of crazy stuff out there. But sometimes, you know, that first impression is the right one, okay? Because I don't see why Bruce Lee would have hidden this fact, okay? Yeah, Especially being that he was never really sense. claiming to be a super traditional Wing Chun guy anyway. And at that time when he was living in Seattle, he was looking, as John Little said, to create that super Chinese Kung Fu system. So he wanted to find out all the other different martial arts. So why would Bruce, if anyone was hiding Bruce's, hiding Fook Young's influence on Bruce Lee, it was Bruce Lee. Yeah. Okay. And if there was anyone who wants to say I was the biggest influence on Bruce Lee, it was Fook Young later, or at least his students. So I don't wow. know whether Fook Young was feeding this BS to his students or his students kind of retroactively tacked this BS onto Bruce Lee's story. Okay. But this guy was like, yeah, he learned from eight years. And I'm like, uh, he learned from him for eight years. And I go, oh, uh, I go and I, I put him in a trap. He didn't realize he fell for it, right? <laughs> because sometimes people will change his story in the comments. So I go, uh, oh, did Fook Young move to California? And he goes, well, I don't know that. But uh, Fook Young taught Bruce Lee in Seattle. I go, oh, how did he teach him in Seattle for eight years when Bruce barely lived there for four? So it was like, okay, already. OK, but do you see this is it's, how the this is how the sausage is made I mean, of like a little rumor. And then suddenly, oh, now he's learned from eight years. You can look at the timeline. Where were there eight years? He was Bruce probably with this Bruce guy? Lee this whole time. All the time. Yeah. All the time. He was in the background. Right. All right. Always teaching so him and was, showing yeah, him stuff. Right. Yeah. And he even claimed like, you know, that uh, uh, this thing that was in Dan Inosanto's school about absorb what is uh, uh, useful and blah, 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 which. Jeet Kune, I'm not going to get in this debate. So anyone okay. wants to get into the debate in my comments, go to a Jeet Kune Do channel. I'm not here for that. Yeah. But there's a big debate about that famous saying about uh, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless. That that saying, Bruce Lee never said that. That that was something that was posted in the Inosanto Academy. And that was something from Dan Inosanto. That was Dan Inosanto's reflection on Jeet Kune Do. Now, it's possible before people get up in arms, okay? Right. The fact that I'm saying that, I'm just telling you what, I'm not saying I believe it one way or another, because whether Bruce Lee said that or didn't say that, all right, I'll still be able to sleep tonight, okay? 
All right. But people get so upset because their identities are wrapped up into whether that is true or not. All right. I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight, though. But anyway, this this Fook Young cultist guy is like he, Fook Young was the one who came up with that saying who opened Bruce Lee's mind to being a, a more open, westernized martial artist. Right. So anyway. We're like half Someone's an hour into it. We haven't credit. even talked about this conversation <laughs> know, yet, right? Okay, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, I promise we'll get some of the conversation in there. So, so that was the weird Fook Young thing, right? Okay. Now, uh, at the beginning of the conversation, which was basically most of what we talked about in the very first episode, yes. Bruce Lee talks to Daniel Lee about the Tai Chi self defense, okay? Uh, about there being some kind of tournament or some kind of fight. And uh, him basically Bruce Lee saying like, hey, look at these guys. These guys are terrible. They don't have any conditioning. Uh, they don't know how to fight. They're going in there without a plan, right? yeah. Now, there was no, you know, to my mind, no context about what exactly is he talking about here, right? And so I guessed, as have some other people, that Bruce Lee was somehow talking about this fight that happened in 1954, which we did. We talked about that on the tournaments yeah, episode, that right? First televised. Yeah, fight. that that whole the whole background behind that fight, right, between the white crane guy and the the Tai Chi guy, right? It turns out there was someone in the comments, Hong Kong T Lee, Hook T Lee, all right. Who, yeah. who just decided that he didn't like me because I made a mistake or I didn't know and not realizing that I have a very open mind about, hey, if there's better information out there, let me know. I want to be corrected. But, you know, he, get, he got really hot. He got really testy in the comments. Yeah. And I was like, hey, man, why don't you be on my podcast? And he was like, why don't you open your mind? It's like, I have an open mind. I want you on my <laughs> podcast, right? You're, you're the one that's so, you're being defensive for no reason, right? So anyway, uh, Hong Kong T. Lee, or Hook T. Lee, as I like to call him, pointed out that, uh, and by the way, he didn't even say it in the first comment. I, I needed to answer his snark before oh. he mentioned it in the second comment. Like, he was like, oh, you're barking up the wrong tree that uh, Bruce Lee is talking about this 1954 fight. And then I'm like, oh, he, you know, and then it takes one or two comments back and forth be before he says, in 1971, late 71, there was apparently an open televised tournament or you know martial arts contest on mm -hmm. tvb which is the main hong kong tv channel and it included um martial artists from tai chi and wing chun and other martial arts as well and i talked a little bit about this on the debunking episode but this was televised and this was late 71 i believe he said december of 1971 got it and that would put it in the perfect time period for this conversation because this conversation with Daniel Lee is either late, super late 71, most likely early 72. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it would totally make sense that um, he could be talking about this thing on TVB, right? Could be. Um, my only, the only thing that I don't know about is how did Daniel Lee see that in the US if this was something that was supposedly, I mean, it also doesn't answer that question for the 1954 fight either. But I'm just saying there are gaps of knowledge here that if there are people out there in, podcast land and youtube land that can answer that for me uh -huh. i would love to know like so where was this shown how was it promoted right. and so i believe we did ask people to chime in if they knew what video bruce lee was talking about referring uh, what, to. yeah so we it is so it it's clearly some kind of tournament uh -huh. all right um and it ha apparently it was televised on tvb so a couple things about that one i believe that if footage of this existed or exists it would be on youtube if you look, a lot of early TVB stuff. Um, so TVB was the main TV station that was owned by Shaw Brothers. Shaw Brothers had the movie studios and they had a TV station. T TVB is a lot like what the BBC is in the UK. They're like the main one, okay? And so the problem is Bruce Lee did a number of interviews for TVB at that time. And you can't, th there's no footage of those things. Wow. You, there's a couple people who shot with a Super 8 camera off the TV screen. So you see some clips that are super sped up, but you cannot actually get uh, this stuff. They don't have copies of it because from what I heard from some of my friends in Hong Kong that they either, they didn't save or archive any of the old stuff hmm. with the exception of still photo photographs. 
And sometimes, I don't know if it's possible, they may have even reuse the film. I don't know if you can reuse that old film to record stuff. Ooh. But for whatever reason, they didn't archive that stuff. And I heard in the particular case of Bruce Lee's early interviews, because no one knew that this guy would become an icon. So they didn't care. He'd do an interview and it would it would show once on live right. TV and that would be it. Yeah, no one had any clue. Yeah, there was no replay or any of that kind of stuff. So when, when you see these things being referenced like Bruce Lee being on TVB for the charity from the landslides and stuff, you see still shots. You don't actually see footage of that. So if there was an actual tournament between different martial arts or let's say an open demonstration or an open fight between different styles, well, then very much like the Bruce Lee stuff, there probably is no existing footage of it. Now, I would love to be completely wrong about that because I would love to see it. I don't think, I don't think that a bunch of traditional Kung Fu guys fighting in a tournament in 71... I don't think that's going to blow anyone's socks off. I think you're going to see very much like you see oftentimes when Kung Fu people fight in the ring, that they're a bit ill-equipped for it, all right? Especially at that time. Got it. If you want to use a traditional Chinese martial art in a ring nowadays, but even back then, you need to have some idea of ring tactics and strategy and footwork and boxing and kickboxing and moving back and forth. Having that as a base you're more likely to be able to inc implement your more traditional yeah. tactics, right? Like even but, early UFC stuff was just exactly, shit show. <laughs> exactly, right? So I have, I, I'm under no illusion that if someone could magically produce this footage, that what we're going to see is something that looks like a Kung Fu fight out of a Shaw Brothers movie. You're going <laughs> to see a lot of people who probably never fought in the ring. So Bruce, if he is referencing some 1971 televised fight or tournament, the reaction that he had to it and his observations about that fight, about how those Tai Chi guys couldn't fight. And and you see that they went in there with absolutely no game plan and, you know, and like uh, um, the way that they kicked and, you know, running out of gas, you know, getting tired. Yeah. It plays almost exactly like the 1954 right. Tai Chi fight right there. Right. So um, uh, I, I totally concede that I could have been totally wrong about it. And I mentioned when we did that episode, look, I, I, I'm sure. It might be this, but I'm not 100% yeah. sure. Turns out I'm wrong. I'm totally fine with being wrong. I'm wrong all the time. Just ask my wife, okay? <laughs> right, right. But, <laughs> but I don't think that what you would have seen on TV if a Tai Chi guy fought either another Tai Chi guy or fought another Kung Fu guy mm -hmm. would have looked much different than that 1954 fight because you have Tai Chi, which is a fantastic martial art, but very ill-equipped for ring fighting. Mm -hmm. I don't see why, oh, you know, you're going from 1954 to 1971, almost 20 years later. I don't see why it would have looked any different. Right. If you're barking right. up the wrong tree is definitely a good tree to be barking exactly, up. Exactly. <laughs> right. So so um, while I totally concede being wrong about or potentially being wrong about the fight. Yeah. I think that our observations of that 1954 fight fit into place, fit into place. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that to justify what I said. I just said sight unseen. I don't think that that 1971 Tai Chi duel is going to blow your socks off in a way that the 1954 one didn't. Okay. <laughs> Good. Now, of course, I would also be curious to see about the Wing Chun peeps who fought and who, you know, from what, which Wing Chun school they were and so on mm. and so forth. 1971. All right. Grandmaster Yip Man was still alive. Yeah. So I'm very curious in terms of who went out there and who fought and who they were and so on and so forth. Curious if that was that in too. fact the case. All right. Uh, so anyway, that that was my update for um, the, uh, the the Bruce Lee Tai the, talking about the Tai Chi thing, um, and then finally before we get started, some <laughs> thirty five minutes in into this, uh, yeah, it's like now is it's um, now I think whenever I talk about something historical, and people chime in and give me new information, whenever we do a follow up, I think thirty minutes of it is just going to be housekeeping. Yes. What have I learned so far, okay. right? Because again, I'm I'm super excited to learn about this, and for that hook to Lee guy really knows about this stuff in detail. I would love to have him on the podcast. And he, he mentioned that he had been doing this for like 60 years or he'd been around the wow. martial arts scene for 60 years. But he just acts like every other internet troll on YouTube, right? And it's just like, all right, man, look. He's been trolling for 60 years. Yeah, it's like, hey, man, why don't we have you on the podcast? I would love for you to tell this stuff, right? Okay. If I'm wrong, you know, and, and of course, there's a lot of bias because if, if you know, if you're, if you're not Chinese, you're automatically wrong. And because within the Chinese community, even the, all the other Chinese sifus, they're going to tell you that they're wrong. So they don't even trust anything another Chinese sifu says, much less some young kid from New York. And by the way, I'm 43. I'm not even a young kid. Um, <laughs> and I just have a fascination with this. I, I, I cannot claim authority. No one, there's no authority in any of this stuff. You have some minor experts 
but you have no authorities, okay? Oh, and that's man. that's for Bruce Lee, that's for Wing Chun, that's for all this stuff, okay? So anyway, um, at the very beginning of the second part of the conversation, and we mm -hmm. even talked about it last time, Bruce Lee mentions Lao Tai Chun, right? This supposed fight that he had. Yes, and, you got to uh, update on that, right? Yeah, and now talks about how, you know, Lao Tai Chun had not even slapped his face. Well, because... I believe at the time of this phone conversation, Lao Tai Chun was only taunting Bruce Lee in the press, but they had yet to meet face to face. Now, the story is that they eventually did meet. The question is when. I believe if the fight did occur, that it actually happened very early 73. Late 72, perhaps. But I believe it might have even happened around the time he was shooting or in pre-production for Enter the Dragon. Wow. Uh, because it, he told Bolo about it, and it seems that Bolo asked him on the set because Bolo had heard about it because it had happened recently. So this is my speculation, and again, I can be totally wrong about it, but I, I believe that if there was a confrontation between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun, it happened late 72, maybe, but probably early 73, maybe January, maybe even February, okay? okay. So I recently and again this the whole reason i did this podcast is sort of there are people out there who know this stuff and it's crazy we get some cool get at we, us we yeah. get some gems in the comments like hook to lee telling me about this thing even though he does it in a snarky crappy way <laughs> um and but it, but what i get is i get emails and i get personal messages sent to me like hey hey mr genius here's something you might not have seen Ooh. now also i have to admit out of 10 of those Eight of them, I've seen all that stuff they're sending me. There was a guy who sent me a Facebook message was this long yesterday. And he's like telling me all about the Wong Sun Leung fight in Taiwan. And he sends me all the, and I've literally seen and read all that stuff. Oh. It's just I didn't mention some of those things because they weren't relevant to that podcast. Okay. And then sends me an article about Tang Sang and all this stuff. There's not a single thing about Tang Sang that exists in the internet that I haven't seen, or I'm not the one who wrote it, <laughs> okay? Oh, so nice. it's like, it's very cute, right? But it's like, I, I think people don't realize, like this is literally all I do, right? Mm. But two out of those 10 messages, and by the way, keep them coming. Don't worry if I've seen it or not. Right. Just send me whatever you got. Uh, just know that the shorter my response, the more likely I've already read it, right? Okay. I'll go, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, they uh, Somebody sent me, I can't say who, but somebody sent me an account uh, from Lam Cheng Ying, who was a, an actor. Most Wing Chun people know him from Prodigal Son. He was in Bruce Lee's uh, Fist of Fury, and he was a stuntman in most of Bruce Lee's films. He did stunts for Sekin, and, yes. and you know, I think he's in all of Bruce's films except maybe um, Way of the Dragon. And but he does right. stunts and and he was someone who was in Bruce's he was entourage, like a right right hand man yeah. type of guy. And there were stories about like him. Nifka. Yeah, right, exactly, right. <laughs> and there were stories about him getting mad at Lao Tai Jun for uh, you know challenging Bruce Lee in the press and so on and so forth. So um, I got a very, I can't say I'll just say this. Okay, obviously I feel a little. <laughs> I have to be very careful about how I how you word it. This, okay? okay, I. I received an extremely credible account of something Lam Ching Ying said about the fight between Lao Tai Chun and Bruce Lee. Um, I can't say I can't say from whom, and I can't say what it is. All I can say is, it's extremely credible. Okay. Uh, Lam Ching Ying uh, described the fight, the what happened between Bruce and Lao Tai Chun. And the story was that uh, they were at a banquet. And so this, uh, I assume this is some kind of industry banquet, something in the movie world, you know, maybe they're a bunch of movie stars. They're having, you know, Chinese love to have banquets. And, the, you know, they rent these big halls and they have Chinese yeah. food and you have the big round table. And, and who's, a couple of these. Who's, yeah. Who sits where is a big oh, deal, right? Man. And uh, so Bruce is at one of these things. And I think Lam Ching Ying is with him as is probably some of his other boys, right? And... Lao Tai Chun comes up to Bruce, all right? And this is after he had been taunting him in the press, after this conversation here, and uh, says um, that, you know, he wants to challenge Bruce Lee. And finally, he this comes like, up to the table. Yeah, and so Bruce says in this phone conversation, like, <laughs> oh, I have yet to turn the other cheek. We'll hear it again in a moment. Like, he has not even come up to me to challenge me. Yo. So this was definitely before this, okay? Okay, and Bruce said, 
okay, fine. All right. Like he says in this uh, um, conversation, he's, I've yet to refuse a challenge, right? La Lao Tai Chun apparently comes up to Bruce, says he wants to fight him. And Bruce says, okay, fine. And he says, but maybe we should go somewhere where there's, you know, there's too many people here. It's in the middle of a banquet, right? So they go to another location. Now, this secondary location in the Lam Ching Ying account doesn't say where it is. But that's, that secondary location could be Tang Sang's home. Now, is it reasonable that they went from a banquet all the way? Tang Sang's home was in Fan Leng, which is all the way. It's where Grandmaster Yip Man's yes. grave is. You remember there, right? Right. So if the banquet like happened 20, somewhere. 20, 30-minute drive? Yeah, but, and back then, I don't think they, had, they didn't have the same MTR uh, there, too. Uh, right. I mean, I think you still took a train, but it was still a bit of a huff to get up yeah. there, right? Uh, so I don't know, okay, if the banquet was somewhere in Hong Kong Island or on the Kowloon side, I don't know how reasonable it would be that they went all the way up to Fan Lang for this fight, okay? So I'm going to say maybe, maybe the banquet was in the Fan Lang area. Maybe, all right? Although at that time, okay. Fan Lang was like almost countryside, Scarce, just countryside right. right? But you did have some prominent people who lived there, so it's possible there could have been some ball or restaurant up there. Maybe they wanted to eat there because it was away from the prying eyes of the paparazzi, right? So it's like a bunch of movie stars go yeah. to have Chinese food somewhere where it's not like in the middle of Kowloon Secluded. where everyone's going to... Yeah, so maybe, okay? But again, that is pure speculation because Lam Ching Ying's account, right. um, which is in Chinese, does not say where that secondary location is and it doesn't say where the banquet was. So mm. you can only speculate some stuff about that, right? But he says that they go to the secondary look and look and the secondary location could just have been outside right in the out hallway. In the I mean, like, so, so here's <laughs> yeah. the thing. I'm not, tr I'm not trying to fit the Tang Sang thing in there. It's just that multiple sources say the fight happened at Tang Sang's home. Mm -hmm. So even people that I've talked to who said they were there. So that's the only reason why I have to square it a little bit, but hey, it could be totally wrong. Okay. The story and Lam Ching Ying explains what happened because he was there and he watched it. And he says that Lao Tai Chun is standing there across from Bruce and Bruce is there. And he says that Lao Tai Chun is staring at Bruce Lee's legs <laughs> because Bruce had the nickname of Lei Sam Gurk, the three legged Lee. Yeah. All right. Because of his ability, his <laughs> kicking to, ability. He's right trying ever, to count right? his legs. Yes, yeah, so he's trying to count his legs. One, yeah. two. The, well, there's a very, a very funny two. story about uh, the, the Japanese actor Yasuaki Kurata, whom I've met before, who was in uh, Heroes of the East, and he was in Fist of Legend with Jet Li. Yeah. He said when he met Bruce Lee, he didn't know who Bruce Lee was before he met him. He just heard the nickname Samgak, and he said he really thought this guy might have had three legs. <laughs> <laughs> because it was kind of a very strange nickname, right? And uh, okay. yeah, so uh, it's interesting because the the the, um, the nickname oh, uh, Lei Samger was actually given to him by the first director of Big Boss, who was fired and replaced by Lo Wei. And that director called yeah. Bruce Lee that in a derogatory way because he he meant that oh Bruce was kind of like a three trick pony, mm -hmm. right? Because he wanted everything to be done in the operatic style, where it's like you know mo like pam pam pam, like multiple beats in a fight scene. And Bruce just wanted to annihilate everyone with one kick or one punch, especially because if he didn't annihilate everyone with right. one kick or one punch, then what was he going to do in the, against the final villain where he has to fight him for a long time? If, if every fight that he has takes him multiple moves to beat up this guy, well, then the last fight is going to have to be an hour, right? <laughs> so he does right. it to set up how badass the villain is, right? That, that Bruce even has to fight beyond two or three moves with this guy, mm -hmm. right? So... But the first director called him that because he's like, oh, he's just a three-trick pony. He's no good. That nickname tends to stick, even though it was for derogatory purposes. And then later, because he's so good at kicking and doing all that stuff, it's like he has three legs, right? And then even later in, in, in the newspapers, when Bruce gets a little bit of a reputation for being a ladies' man, yeah. that name takes <laughs> then a third meaning as well, right? So it's a very funny thing. So anyway... La Lao Tai Chun is apparently standing there and he's staring at Bruce Lee's legs, <laughs> convinced, I assume, that Bruce is going to try to kick him. And Lam Ching Ying, <laughs> when he says this story, notices that Lao Tai Chun is looking at, staring at Bruce Lee's legs, right? And then Bruce, boom, one move and punches Lao Tai Chun and the fight is over. All right. So in some accounts, it was one kick and the fight was over. In other accounts, it was one punch and the fight was over. Hmm. But it seems that these varying accounts, which, of course, are going to have conflicts on the detail, 
it was one move and it was over. One and done. Yeah. And <laughs> Just the like funny in the thing movies. is, at the end of this account in Chinese, uh, Bruce Lee apparently says to Lam Ching Ying, he says, well, he was staring at my legs. And that was the no the moment I noticed he doesn't know martial arts. Oh. He doesn't know martial arts. It was like the phrase, right? Yeah. And so so either so either way it seems like Lao Tai Chun was vanquished with either one punch or one kick. All right. So anyway, Man. 47 minutes in, <laughs> that is what I've learned from our first two episodes. So now Never let's stare finally at third leg. Yeah, don't stare at someone's third leg, especially <laughs> no. if, you, if you're challenging this guy to a fight, right? <laughs> right? But it's also true. I mean, how many times I tell you guys, like, if you're working on kick defense, well, don't stare at the legs. You're working, like, you you have to know where to look, and you cannot get what's known as target fixation, right? right. You're just looking at the leg, looking at the leg, and you don't see that jab that's Boom. coming at your face, right? You're looking at the front hand, and you don't see that he's loading you up for a rear kick or something, right? So you, you cannot get tar target fixation is usually the sign of an amateur, right? Or someone who's still in the process of learning basics in martial arts, right? And so Lao Tai Chun apparently, according to Lam Ching Ying, made this very basic uh, <laughs> error, all right? So anyway, Ooh. let's uh, let's listen to it and we're gonna just retread a couple seconds over what we already did in yes. the previous one, all right? So let's have a listen. Lao Tai Chun is yeah. manly enough instead of going to the newspaper yeah. or walk up to me and slap, that's the end of him. <laughs> yeah, so he says, at this point, Lao Tai Chun has not come up to him, and he mm -hmm. says, you know, I have yet to turn the other cheek, you know, kind of invoking yeah. some biblical reference in there. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> uh, well, in fact, I think the fact you right now, you, uh, uh, I would say, 15 years ago, you said Lao Tai Chun, you just said, okay, pick a time. I'm gonna just pick be the time? Yeah. I will go say the time. You said I won't even say anything. I'll just show up later. So, <laughs> so that's very funny, right? And again, why do I love this conversation? Because this is Bruce take Lee. The time. Take the time. Because Daniel Lee says, well, if this happened 10 years ago, you would just say, pick the time, right? And Bruce kind of laughs it off saying, yeah. pick, the time, pick the time, I'll just show up. Yeah. But I believe at this time, and I know this from looking at some of the Hong Kong newspaper headlines, Lao Tai Jun was just taunting Bruce Lee in the press. But he had not actually come up to him or they had not seen each other face to face. And Bruce kind of in a point in his both in his career and also in his martial arts development where he's like, hey, first of all, why am I going to waste my time with this nonsense? Mm -hmm. But if the guy wants to fight me, he need only show up or we need only say that this is the place. Right. So Bruce was still very much game, even at this point. He, you know, boom, people say, oh, he was just a movie guy. He was all competitive. He was still on, pretty whatever. game to, yeah. to, to actually throw down. So let's continue. Right in front of his door waiting for him. Yeah. <laughs> That's all there is to it. I mean, well, I have yet refused one challenge yeah. ever since I was in the United States. Yeah. Long time, man. And I always say, don't you dare to do that. Yep. So there he goes, right? You know, it's like, I'll show up to his <laughs> doorstep, this. right? And he goes, since I've been in the U.S., I have yet to refuse one challenge, right? Like Wong Jack Man and all these bullshit artists, right? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, that's the way. And, and oh, it's interesting God. because I believe this recording is the only time you actually hear Bruce Lee say the name Wong Jack Man because he never mentions it and he only mentions it in his letters Yo. to his students, right? And obviously he mentioned it in face to face conversation, but I think this is the only recording where you can actually hear him actually say the name Wong Jack Man and certainly hear him say the name Lao Tai Chun. So, for that reason, I mean, this that's why I always say this conversation is a gem. Yeah, yeah the Pierre Burton interview is great. He's got the whole, you know, be water, my friend, right? Mm -hmm. And that whole thing. Oh, yeah. We, everyone's Classic. heard that a million times, yeah. right? <laughs> but you million. never hear him say that guy was a bullshit artist, right? <laughs> and, you know, and I have yet to turn the other cheek in yeah. time. We'll just show up to his doorstep, right? Pick a time. This really lets you know what it would have been like to just hang with oh. Bruce Lee. And that's why I love this conversation. So let's continue. So that's very interesting because he's like, yeah. you know, first thing I ask is, do I have any fear or doubt about this person? I okay? don't. I don't. Yeah. Okay. 
do I know what his intention is? I, I do. do. <laughs> okay? So that's all there is that's to it. Now, what's interesting know. is that is a very street-style way of basically quoting Art of War. Because in yeah. Art of War, which is so integrated into the Chinese mindset, not just for martial arts, but the way they do business, the way they think, the idea is that if you know yourself, okay, and you don't know your enemy, you win maybe 50% of the time. Okay, mm. but if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you win 100 percent of the time. So he's basically saying in a more modern street way, like, uh, do I have any do I have any doubt about this guy? Do I fear this guy? Meaning, like, do I understand myself and my abilities in relation to this guy? And then do I know what his intentions are? Meaning, do I understand my enemy? Yes. Yes. So was it? it's basically at least, you know, and I, I could be kind of grafting that on there. But for me, this is a kind of modern way a modern street poet mm. way yeah. of of discussing a yeah. very fundamental art of war philosophy about you have to understand yourself you have to understand your tools your intentions your emotions and you have to understand your opponent this is what's necessary in order to be uh, effective in combat or in negotiations or whatever right so let's continue oh, sweet That's really interesting, right? Whoa. Because you see, as much as Bruce Lee is speaking to Daniel Lee in a very kind of friendly kind of way, he's still Daniel Lee's teacher and yeah. he's still the guy who knows something, right? It's a process, yeah. right? And this was always Bruce Lee's thing, all right? And I think people don't realize that. They look at a lot of the things, the way he did movies or whatever. These are like his set characteristics. He was constantly in a process of development, right? And he tries to, even in a pretty innocuous statement by his student. He's like, no, 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 you have to understand. There is no maturity. There is maturing. It is a process, mm. right? And this is the lens by which, from what I understand, he views most things in life. And it's interesting that he had to kind of stop it there for a moment and be like, no, no, no. Yeah. We need to get this thing straight before we continue this relatively lighthearted conversation, mm. right? So let's continue. <laughs> yeah. It's always con continually. Uh, you might be deteriorating physically in the long process of aging, but shit, man, your discovery daily is still the very, you know, same. You know? So that's interesting, you know, saying like, you know, the word ma maturity, it's a conclusion, right? And this was also something when, you, especially when you read a lot about Bruce Lee's martial art philosophies, which had a lot of influence from Fulk Young. Just kidding. Um, from, <laughs> from, 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 especially from Krishnamurti at that time. And it's interesting because, you know, he, he would always use words like this is a crystallization when you have a set style or formal set of techniques and, and that it shouldn't be about that. It should be about a constant process, right? And he's talking about, yeah, you basically might as well close the coffin oh, when you get to that point. He says, oh. and it's also interesting what he, what he says about, because you could be old and deteriorating, but you can still be developing, yeah. right? And I find that interesting. How much Bruce, he's 32 years old. And he's having this kind of conversation about like, you know, kind of knowing and at some point you're not going to be that guy you are at 32 anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. But he was already thinking in that kind of way. And that gives us a very tiny window into what could have been for Bruce Lee, because, you know, one of the things we're robbed of is to see what would Bruce, what would have become a Bruce Lee after 32. Right. And so he mentions a little Highway bit that robbery. E even at 32, he still had some very forward thinking ideas about what your life is like when you get older and you're no longer the person who can do the things you could when you were yeah. in your prime. Whereas you see a lot of people who are tremendous athletes or martial artists, when they start, when the skills start fading as they get older, you see the, it's not always pretty. And I wouldn't necessarily mm. say that they're still in development. You see that they get very regressive in their mentality, trying to hold on to something that's no longer there. Mm. But at Bruce Lee at 32 was already well aware that at some point in his life, this could be an inevitability, that he's going to have to face the fact that he's getting older, right? All right, let's continue. Every day. Well, I think uh, you're, you're actually 
Okay, so what he's saying there is he, he says to to his Sifu, he's like, you know, and, and again, I, I think Daniel Lee is great, but you hear a little bit in this conversation, he's kind of like, see Sifu, I was taking notes, I remember these things, like he's kind of raising his hand, you know, like uh, sometimes people just want to tell you like, see, oh, I know what you were saying, right? So do you, do you hear that he's mentioning the scrolls? Yes. Okay, so those are the scrolls that Bruce Lee had, which are part of the Jeet Kune Do logo which is to use uh, using no way as way, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that idea is kind of what he's talking about, right? You know, have, have, having no method as method, using no way as way, right? And that is a huge cornerstone of the Jeet Kune Do philosophy, right? And so Daniel Lee is basically telling him, like, you are now realizing this thing, right? Because the fact that Bruce Lee already was talking about these things in the early stages of Jeet Kune Do doesn't mean that he had he feels or felt that he had necessarily achieved those things, at least as far as I understand. He's thinking about being in a process, right? And his student is basically telling him, like, it sounds like you are kind of achieving that, this hmm. kind of ideal in, in, um, in JKD, you hmm. know? So let's continue. When it's trapped, it's rotten. And when it's <laughs> rotten, it's lifeless, right? Again, always talking about being in a process, right? Think about how forward thinking this is in the early 70s from someone who essentially came from a traditional Chinese martial arts background, right? You even have people in modern martial arts, um, whether that's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Muay Thai or whatever, who are, are actually have a very traditional mindset in the martial art that they practice, but in that old kind of... Mm. crystallized mindset right so the fact that people do modernize martial arts nowadays doesn't necessarily mean that they have also evolved their philosophy of martial arts in the, the way, way that bruce thinking, lee had already right. done at that point right so let's continue well whatever you said has been making a great impact on in my training in my uh, thinking on the martial art as a whole i mean it seems like once you talk to you and so on work in this you never never would ever go back to Yeah, so uh, there you go, talking about, you know, once you have decided to go down this path of development, you're not going to go back to traditional martial arts like Kempo. Now, why does Daniel <laughs> Lee, who's, I yeah. believe at that time, his, his pr previous experience was in boxing, mm -hmm. and he also taught Tai Chi. He taught Tai Chi later in life, but I assume he already knew Tai Chi at that point because there are actually some photos of him doing some Tai Chi postures and Bruce would be in a JKD posture and Daniel Lee would be in a oh, Tai Chi posture. So he already obviously knew some Tai Chi at this point. But the reason why Kempo comes up is because Kempo in Southern California, that was like the predominant martial art that people were doing. Oh, So right. a, a lot of Bruce Lee's um, LA students were former Kempo karate practitioners. Ah, the jump da off. Dan Inosanto used to be an assistant under Ed Parker and also Steve Golden, who's, you know, my, my late yeah. uh, um, podcast partner, Big Sean Madigan, Steve Golden is his Sifu. Steve Golden was an Ed Parker Kempo karate guy before he went to Bruce Lee. Wow. And I believe, you know, Ed Parker and Bruce Lee knew each other because, you know, those tournaments where Bruce Lee gave those demonstrations, yeah. those were the Ed, Ed Parker, Parker. Uh, invitationals, right. right? So they obviously knew each other. They'd known, I think they already met in Oakland and, uh, now suddenly Bruce is starting to get a little prominence in Los Angeles and suddenly Ed Parker's losing some of his top guys to Bruce Damn. Lee. So I heard that Ed Parker was a little salty about some of his top guys going over to Bruce. Yeah. Um, but you have to imagine that Ed Parker at that time, he was he was the man because, uh, you know, karate was in full swing. Kempo was a very specific and popular style of it. And Elvis Presley was learning from uh, <laughs> yeah. Ed Parker. 
Okay. Yes. So you you know y- it's right. the yeah. style that's teaching Elvis. Okay. <laughs> Thanks pin. to Elvis. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and Ed Parker later went on to uh, I think he was in one of the Pink Panther movies. He had like a very small role. And what? So, yeah, he was he was pretty prominent, and so he, I he was that? yeah he was like he was the man, right? So I believe that when Daniel Lee dis- mentions Kempo Karate. I don't think he's mentioning it specifically to talk ish about that particular style. It's just kind of like in the The generic in the California martial arts scene at that time. Mm -hmm. You had Bruce Lee doing JKD. You had very few Kung Fu styles. I think uh, Kong Baksam Baksam Kong uh, was a Hong Kun practitioner from the Lam Chou lineage in Hong Kong. I believe he was starting to teach Hong Kun. He already had a book out. Okay. But I don't think he was like crazy big. And you had like uh, Ark Wai Wong uh, teaching some Shaolin martial arts. He had been doing that for a really long time. But you didn't have a lot of like super prominent Kung Fu people right. in uh, that were teaching openly. I mean, I'm sure you had people who were teaching kind of behind the scenes. It was pretty much Ed Parker's Kempo Karate. And then you probably had uh, Sport Judo and a few other things in there, right? And you, you and obviously you had Chuck Norris and his Tang Sudo and stuff yeah. like that. But I believe he just invokes the word Kempo because at that time, nowadays when people think of like a, a more generic martial art, people might just say kickboxing. They're not going to say Muay Thai or like, like, you know, oh, I do kickboxing, right? And it's it's all, kickboxing has become the new karate. In the 80s, it's like, oh, that dude does karate. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and the guy might have been a kung fu practitioner, but, you know, like my Cuban family, yes, right? Uh, it's just about Every time I'm in Miami, you know, my my <laughs> old cousins and stuff is, Alex, how'd you karate school? Right, <laughs> yes. okay, they still think I teach karate, right? Because they're from that old school where martial arts was just karate. karate. All yeah, right, yeah. that was it, right? They still ask me what color my belt is, right? <laughs> and like, oh, Alex is a black belt, right? I have a black belt in Taekwondo, yeah, right? But right. Th- th- I don't wear that belt when I teach Wing Chun, all right? Uh, yeah, it's still great. great. But yeah, from like that generation, it was like, oh, you did karate. Yeah, all that's right? it. And nowadays, I think it's like kickboxing is kind of the more, ge- not Muay Thai or any specifics, it's like kickboxing is kind of the generic thing people do, right? Mm. And so I think that in that pocket, at least for LA, it was like Kempo. You know, like people do yeah. Kempo, right? Especially Makes for people sense. in there. Yeah. So let's go ahead and continue. You look at that quite a large man, you know. I mean, he's constantly growing. And uh, when he is bound by a set pattern of ideas or, or way of doing things, that's when he stops growing. That's right. <laughs> yeah, again, continuing on this kind of growth and Keep development growing. thing, right? Let's continue. I'm lucky. That's about it. That's about it. it. Yeah, he also worked pretty hard, too. (laughs) Well, actually, you have influenced many people in terms of freedom from their original boundary. Uh, uh, Well, I hope so. Yeah. It's interesting. And again, Daniel Lee sounds like, well, you have influenced so many people to break away from their original boundaries. Like he just uh, and again, there's no disrespect to late Daniel Lee, but it just sounds like he's. He's trying to, like, you know, puff his Sifu up a little bit, right? But you hear Bruce, he's like, well, maybe. I don't think Bruce is convinced. Oh. I think that he kind of feels like, uh, n- not necessarily that he was equa- equating himself to being like a modern-day prophet or iconoclastic prophet of martial arts, but I believe that he probably felt that his message of kind of breaking away from the restrictions and the shackles, yeah. whether they're actual or mind forged manacles of martial arts, I think that he still felt that it was being, uh, that it was falling on deaf ears at that time. I, I think he still, and and to be fair, and I'm not going to litigate Jeet Kune Do and the nature of Jeet Kune Do because there are politics within Jeet Kune Do, whether the nature of Jeet Kune Do is the original Jeet Kune Do that Bruce Lee practiced or whether you should follow the concepts of Jeet Kune Do. And, you know, and, and so JKD people, they're with, I mean, just like any martial art, they're Wing Chun people don't like Wing Chun people. The JKD people, the most hate about JKD you get within JKD. The oh, most right. hate about Wing Chun is as much as people out there might want to troll Wing Chun, there is no more hate about Wing Chun than within the Wing Chun within family. The Wing Chun all right? World, right. And same, but same with Kempo, same with even when Maso Yama died in mm-hmm. Kyokushin Karate. That causes a schism. And then, I mean, it, it's, it, it's not like oh, politics is a Wing Chun or JKD thing. 
every single martial art. Brazilian jiu-jitsu has politics, right. right? Between people who want to do it in a more old school way and focus on self-defense versus people who want to do it in a very modernized and updated sport jiu-jitsu way versus people who train it for MMA. And there's some people who can view all of those things as part of the landscape. And there's some people that are like, no, you got to do this. So you cannot escape it. Um, once you have two people doing the same thing, there's going to be politics, right? And so, but I think that Bruce Lee felt, and rightly so, that, yeah, he might be saying these things and people might repeat what he says, but I think that he had doubts that um, it was actually having an impact, mm. right? And, and it makes and sense. I think he was just probably saying or, or seeing that, that it was still kind of fresh or still kind of new. He still wanted to do a lot more. Yes. It was still kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I think so. He had also been kind of plugging that JKDE philosophy for a few years. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. He probably definitely felt it didn't have much of an impact in the greater martial arts world. But I suspect he felt that even some of his own students were like very um, much about like, this is the way Bruce did it. This is the way you need to do it, which is essentially mm -hmm. crystallizing his style, which he Bruce put himself in a very difficult position, yeah. all right? Because he, he he created both a martial art, and you can argue whether that martial art is the Chan Fan Gong Fu or, it's actual, or is JKD a set of martial art principles? Is JKD just a philosophy? I'm not going to litigate that. That's for the <laughs> Jeet Kune Do politicians, right? But I'll yeah. just tell you, like, there are people that go back and forth between is it, like, about the five ways of an attack and the Chan Fan Gong Fu, or is it just about the philosophy or whatever? And, but at the if you kind of take away some of those specific arguments, if you look at JKD as a style that's supposed to kind of break your boundaries, as they're kind of mentioning in here, well, then you don't even need the name JKD. Mm -hmm. And then you don't even need a set group of techniques. But then what do you start with? And then is everything JKD or is nothing JKD, right? So he kind of created a bit of um. Yeah, a, 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 a bit of a yeah, a bit of a pickle for in terms of like well, then what actually is the definition of what you're doing, right? So let's continue. They're talking about Dan Inosanto here. Ah, All right, okay. Says, yeah, he was at my house the night before. Okay, now pay attention. So he was really turned on. <laughs> yeah. So he, he didn't want us to do any more heavyweight kicking. He wanted us to just actually uh, in-step a little bit, you know, work on uh, just, just a... Just, we have three people yesterday. That's all he's going to... Just uh, within our little group. Yeah, because when you use your leg, it, it is much better to use it to... Uh, I mean, to kick it. Yeah, so you can see there's a little bit of ish talking here, all right? Mm. Uh, the Dan tone. D Daniel Lee seems to be kind of going like, uh, well, like because Bruce is living in Hong Kong. Now, from what I understood, this phone conversation happened while Bruce was visiting Los Angeles. So that's what I understood. Some Someone, I don't remember where, someone in the comments or someone who had sent me something said that Bruce had come back very shortly. Perhaps it was to uh, finalize the selling of his house. So okay. he wasn't having this conversation from Hong Kong to Los Angeles. This apparently hmm. was happening in Los Angeles. Now, again, I don't know. I could be wrong on that. I'm just literally telling people what I've heard. So when Hick Talee starts having a hissy <laughs> fit in the comments, all right, right I'll, now, we'll have to, we, yeah, I will have to talk him down from the ledge again and just be like, I'm just talking <laughs> about these things, right? So, uh, but you can you can hear a little bit that it sounds like Daniel Lee's kind of trying to report to his Sifu what's going on in the class while he's away. You know, well, because because Dan Inosanto is the one who is uh, in charge of the class while they're gone. So he's kind of saying, oh, there are only three people there and he's having us do stuff on the heavy bag. And it seems that Bruce wants, would prefer to do it on the kick shields and stuff because there's a little bit more movement, a little more realistic. And then uh. he says the warning about don't do too much Side kick, um, side kicking in the air because you use too much power might not be good for your knee joints or whatever. So that's kind of where they're at right now. So you can you can feel, you know, again, this is a conversation Bruce Lee did not know he was being recorded. Now, yeah. in the very first episode where we did this, I, I I mentioned that he maybe later found out that he was recorded and then wasn't too happy. No, but I have since found out that he never found out that he was recorded. And the first time this conversation was unveiled, and I think I mentioned it in the second episode, was at Bruce Lee's funeral. 
Yeah. That uh, da- that Daniel Lee came and had the recording, and then you know, I mean, not while the funeral was going on, but like people, you know, obviously people miss Bruce Lee. He had just passed away at the height of his fame and everything yeah. like that. And it was so sudden, right? And then, so of course people want to hear his voice. And that, so the story was that he brought this recording and then people could hear it. So I believe, and it makes sense that if Daniel Lee had recorded his Sifu unknowingly, mm. I don't think that he would have played it for anyone and let the cat out of the bag. So I, I really do believe that Bruce never knew that he was being recorded. So you're really getting a very unfiltered take about hmm. what's going on in, in Los Angeles at that time. So let's go ahead and uh, listen. He joined. He joined fingers, huh? Well, I mean, if you snap it too much, you know, without... Well, that means at the end. You know? That's right. Here's another little segment. Let's listen to this. You have seen kickboxing. Oh, yeah, right. I've seen a lot. I saw it in Thailand. First. Hey, you kill all these guys. I'm the phantom sure. weight. So this is interesting because uh, he shot the movie Big Boss in Thailand. Right. So he's basically saying, have you seen kickboxing? He's talk- talking presumably about Thai boxing, right? And he says the bantamweight champion was, I guess, one of the stuntmen on, um, the, uh, in Big Boss. Now, there's long been a rumor that Bruce had a fight with one of the extras or stuntmen. Not, not the Enter the Dragon one, but on the set of Big Boss because Big Boss was shot in Pak Chong, Thailand. Yeah. And that one of the peop- peeps there was like a Thai boxer and had apparently challenged Bruce Lee. Um, it's it's plausible because, you know, uh, at, in the seven, it started in the 60s. Uh, thai, thai boxers were challenging a lot of the more prominent martial arts from Asia because okay. Thai boxing is very powerful and brutal martial art. And they wanted to kind of show... Uh, that what they were doing was superior to the more established martial arts. I believe it started in the mid-60s. They were challenging some of the Japanese karate guys and knocking them out. Ooh. I mean, like, uh, really embarrassing the hell out of them. But to be fair, it wasn't just the Japanese uh, karate practitioners. Also, Chinese kung fu guys went in there thinking they were yeah. going to do monkey fist <laughs> and just getting slashed <laughs> with elbows and low kicks, Ooh. right? So Thai boxing started to gain prominence in Asia because of these challenge fights. I think it wasn't until Maso Yama from Kyokushin, who was really angry that these Thai boxers were making karate look bad, he sent a team down there. One of them is, uh, um, I think, Tarashi Nakamura, who still teaches or is retired now, but his school is on 23rd Street. He was Yo. one of these guys that went to Thailand. It was the first time that some karate guys had had smashed some Thai boxers because these guys were Masoyama's guys, right? These guys were serious. But if you imagine, I think that was also 72, 73, around that time. So this is 71. So this is a time when the Thai boxing is gaining prominence for kind of kicking the crap out of kung fu guys and karate guys, right? Yeah. So here's Bruce Lee kind of saying like, oh, he, you know, he, wa- I believe he watched some Thai boxing while he was in um, Thailand, and then the bantamweight champion was, I guess, an extra or an actor in the film. Got it. Well, the, pop, the problem with them is that uh, they are the John L. Sullivan with their late. <laughs> So what he's talking about here, and this was a complaint of very early Thai boxing, is that the footwork, when you look at very early Thai boxing matches, it didn't have the same level of footwork that modern Thai boxing has. Why? Because Mm. Thai boxing, like every other sport, evolves. Mm -hmm. Same if you watch a basketball game from the 70s, even with the best guys. You compare it now, it's much more fast-paced, and there's a lot more stuff going on because every generation that comes... They start where the previous generation left off, right. right? It's only in Chinese Kung Fu that they don't believe that that's the case. <laughs> no. This generation passes on this perfect thing to the next generation, passes on this perfect thing to the next generation, and it never improves Stays or gets worse. Okay? And uh, if you <laughs> decide to upgrade or modernize something, oh, well, no. now you're no longer traditional. Right. All right? And if anything, they think Kung Fu gets worse with every generation, right? And so only in Chinese Kung Fu does this attitude exist. In any other endeavor in the world... It's understood that the next generation picks up everything the previous generation did and makes Improve it better. Improve on it, yeah. All right? <laughs> Except in the bubble of Chinese Kung Fu. This, this doesn't happen, right? So Thai boxing, in its early incarnation, the actual boxing portion, jab, cross, uppercut, hook, head movement, was not its strong suit. Its strong suit, those powerful leg mm, kicks, right. elbows and knees, the clinch work. But 
from what I understand from my friends who practice Thai boxing, in terms of the pure boxing skill, you could not compare it to like the boxing of, you know, the professional boxers at that time. Got it. But Thai boxing has improved so much as it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Where now the high level Thai boxers, you look at people uh, like Liam Harrison and all of these guys, uh, Liam Badko on Instagram. Yeah. You look at the way these guys box and the way these guys move. These guys are high level in everything. Right. So, again, any of Bruce Lee's criticisms of Thai boxing here. These are criticisms of the Thai boxing of the early 70s, okay? Got it. I believe that Bruce Lee also would have been a fan of Thai boxing as it's in its more modern iteration because it's so much more complete. And modern Thai boxers have really good straight boxing skills. But, of course, those boxing skills have to be integrated with the other ones as well. So you're never going to have a Thai boxer, unless he comes from a boxing background, that has pure boxing skills the way someone who just does boxing is because a Thai boxer's boxing has to also take kicks and clinching and elbows and knees into account. So it's obviously mm -hmm. going to be a little bit different, right? So that's why I have to kind of couch Bruce Lee's criticism here um, a little bit in the backdrop of the Thai boxing at that time is not the Thai boxing of okay. today. No finesse. No finesse. He said no finesse. They do actually, yeah. uh, I guess if they manage to uh, step in the rep in the rear of your thigh, yeah, so they're talking about that low kick going to the leg, causing the opponent to give up. Because you have to imagine what's so normal for us nowadays, low kicks. You see it in MMA, you yeah. see it in Thai boxing, just kind of hacking away Ooh. at the, the, the... That was a relatively new thing there, right? Because round kicks in any form usually came from either karate or taekwondo. Okay. And these were done to the body. And they were done to the head. Yeah. They weren't typically done to the thigh. Cutting down the tree. Right? right? Cutting down the tree. So that's why Daniel's like, yeah, and then they're kind of going for the leg and kind of trying to make you give up, right? Which for us nowadays, we're like, yeah, that's like an obvious thing. <laughs> but that was still at that time relatively novel idea that, you know, rather than going in for that one kick that's going to fell the guy, you're going to win a war of attrition where you're just going to start chopping on that leg mm. over time. So now he cannot move that much. He's not that explosive. He can't box. And then when he can't move that much, then you can start to come in and, and put on some heat, right? They can wrap into a thing. Well, uh, not all of them, they do that. Uh -huh. You know, but, well, they, you can do that when you are stationary, uh -huh. you see, but not when you're constantly moving. That's you know? true. Man. <laughs> well, I feel yeah, interesting. He talks about, yeah. you know, at that time, what was the complaint about or what was the, the level of what was the criticism you could level against Thai boxing that they were relatively flat footed and they just kind of stood there with the front leg kind of and they would wait a little bit more. Whereas modern Thai boxing just has so much more footwork yeah, and has yeah. adapted a lot of things from uh, from Western boxing. So you see a lot of footwork. And now in MMA, you know, if you're not checking the kick the low kick you're using footwork to avoid it right yes so you're not just standing there like who can take the you know like van damme and kickboxer just <laughs> yeah. or in uh blood straight taking kicks. the kicks again right. and again right oh so let's uh listen to this last part here you know, the, the japanese has uh incorporate the, the uh, sweeping kick on their uh, talent's high kick and then really somehow you can see the talent people when they reach their foot is in the air and, uh, and then try to kick in the moment yeah, so again, they were talking about it at that time because Thai boxing was embarrassing uh, some of the karate guys. So what were the karate guys doing? They were trying to come up with stuff specifically to fight Thai right. boxing, right? And the, the way the Thai boxing kick is thrown is very different from the traditional karate and taekwondo kick. So they're talking about at this time, it wasn't so much like nowadays. It's like, well, how do you beat a Thai boxer? You learn a little bit about Thai boxing, yeah. right? You learn how they move, you get an idea, and then Out of you, yeah. you, you, you got to learn the game a little bit, right? But in those days, because the styles were a little bit more tribal, it's like you don't learn that style. You have to come up with an antidote to mm. it, right? And that would still represents a little bit of the older mindset in martial arts thinking. Make a judo throw and uh, poor Katai just having trouble uh -huh. maintaining balance because the kick is too high. Yeah, and again, a lot of those things, at least in the traditional perspective, were a bit telegraphed because the Thai boxers would use a lot of kind of hip motion to do it. But, you know, they still, they gave Kung Fu and karate people the a, a run for their money. Right. So this is kind of the beginning of kind of these things going on there. I'm very curious what Bruce Lee would have thought about the development of Thai boxing. Oh, right. So anyway, 
that is probably a good place to end. Yeah. All right. We are, um, uh, the phone conversation in total is about 22 minutes. And mm -hmm. I think we've managed to get through about 11 and a half minutes. Okay. So we're, wow. we're definitely we making, yardage. we made some yardage oh, finally, right. right? Because the first episode was all of two <laughs> minutes, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so I think that, yeah, maybe one or two more episodes uh -huh. and we will finally have this get thing through, licked, okay. right? So that was a lot of Progress. fun. Progress. That was a lot of fun. All right, peeps. So how did you like that episode? Do any of you out there have any information about that late 1971 fight that supposedly happened on TVB? I would love to know about it. Comment below. And if there's anything else you liked or didn't like about the episode, go ahead and comment below. It always helps the algorithm. And I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a kung fu genius Technique speaks for me, not lineage Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung And I produce masters, you surpassed us Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets City Wing Chung is the house I built Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt Alex Richter, always the... All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu... Oh, wait, I'm looking at the wrong part. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, he, dude, and he came in hot like Hick to Lee on, uh, on YouTube. Oh, so you're barking up the wrong tree Yo, with this so outro. You're barking up the right intro. tree or the wrong tree. That's what's up. All right, peeps, on today's... Ep <sighs> keep looking at this Yo, F-bomb, son. Lots of fuck young. Lots of... Yo, you gotta go! You almost had it, but here's the thing. It's fuck young. <laughs> it tried to drop the yeah. secret F bomb and didn't right. work. Like fuck so. Fuck. Lots of gems. Wow. <laughs> say what, say what, say what. Get fresh crew. Dre, you know what's up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, peeps. <laughs> 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 That was it. <laughs> Lots of fuck young. <laughs> I gotta do the fuck sour and I do the fuck young just to make sure I don't drop an F bomb. People are gonna start to think that the only reason you mess up is because I write random things into the script while you're doing it. Yeah. But I just Why do would this, they even think that? But I just Why do this you? to keep me entertained because it just takes forever. <laughs> and I wanna see if you accidentally say any of those words uh, I throw into the script. <clears throat> Lots of gems. Lots of fuck young. <laughs> Lots of Bruce T. Let's get to it.